Welcome to the chess angle. We had a cheating incident in one of our tournaments, and I'm going to tell you all about it. Stick around. You're not going to want to miss this. So yes, we had a chess cheater at one of our events. Yeah, very sad. It was a sandbagging situation. And what that is, for those of you who may not be familiar with sandbagging, that's where a player deliberately loses games in order to lower his rating or her rating so that he can enter one of these major tournaments with big money prizes and win against lower competition. So let me give an example just to make that clear. So let's say you're rated like 2,000 or 2,100. Uh, Let's use 2,100, better example. Let's say you want to play in the under 2,000. You would enter an event at a smaller club, let's say, you know, drop rating points by deliberately losing games. And then the idea is with your lowered rating, you can now enter a major tournament in a lower section and win money against competition that's clearly weaker than you. All right, which is... One of the problems, by the way, with these, you know, major events, they need to stop, um, you know, these ridiculous cash prizes, you know, it becomes all about the money, but I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. But at any rate, that's what sandbagging is. It's obviously against the rules. You can't do it. The rule book states that you have to play in the spirit of competition. You have to play to win and do your best. And before we get into what exactly what happened to the club, let me share some thoughts about chess cheating in general. So as I just alluded to, one of the issues I have with these major events are these ridiculously large cash prizes. Okay. I think it's bad for the game. I think it attracts a lot of players who are just concerned about the prize fund. And if we got rid of it, if prizes were more tangible, things like trophies or memorabilia or chess books, something like that, you would have players enter these events who are there for chess, who just want to play, and it would eliminate, you know, those who are there for the wrong reasons. So these big money prizes, I do really feel they have to go, especially at the amateur level. And I was speaking to a bunch of other guys at the club, you know, we're all adults and, you know, we would love something like a trophy instead of uh, money. You know, people think, oh, well, that's like for kids or scholastic tournaments. I would love a trophy. And, you know, we were talking about this for like 20 minutes, you know, all of us, you know, fully grown adults. And and we're saying that, you know, that would be fantastic. That wouldn't be a deterrent for me to enter a major tournament. I would love to win a trophy. Make it that instead of these, uh, you know, you know, ridiculous cash prizes. I, I just, I just don't get it. That's my opinion on that. But anyway, moving on, you may be familiar with Tim Just, who is sort of the tournament director and chess tournament uh, guru. You know, he's like a chess organizer guru. He wrote the or edited the rule book. And, uh, you know, he has a column online. And he wrote a great book, by the way, which you might want to check out. It's called My Opponent is Eating a Donut. It's a great title. It's all about uh, interesting tournament stories that have happened. And the reason I'm mentioning Tim in his book, he says that the appearance of cheating and the accusations of cheating are more common than the actual cheating that takes place. And I agree with that. You know, most people are there just to play uh, as competitive as it is, and it's only a few bad apples. But what happens is nowadays, especially with technology, we're so paranoid. Uh, You know, somebody checks a text during the game, well, he must be cheating. That's more for small clubs. I know at a lot of the major events, you're not allowed to have cell phones in the room anymore. But anyway, that's just one example. Or if a player gets up from the board a lot, he must be cheating. He's talking to his friend. He must be cheating. And at scholastic tournaments, the norm now is that parents aren't even allowed in the tournament hall because other parents, uh, you know, were, you know, certain parents, excuse me, were accusing other parents of helping their kids, of like coaching them. You know, every facial tick was interpreted as, you know, you're giving your son or daughter uh, a hint on, you know, what to move. So they just got rid of the parents altogether. They're not even allowed in the tournament hall because it was such an issue. 
And I'm reminded of that scene from Searching for Bobby Fischer, great movie if you haven't seen it, where the camera's on the tournament director and he says, you know, and I want you all to behave and act your age or something like that. And you think he's talking to the kids, but then the camera pans and it's the adults he's talking to. And unfortunately, that's kind of a realistic scene. And then as far as online cheating, that's kind of a whole different thing. This podcast is more about over the board play. I mean, we're going to address online chess, of course, because that's just uh, such a thing nowadays. But anyway, online cheating is a whole different thing because you really don't know what your opponent's doing behind a keyboard. And I know that some sites like I think chess.com has some type of computer program or algorithm that's supposed to be very accurate against detecting cheating now. I don't know too much about it, but they claim it's pretty accurate. So I know they're cracking down, but online, I mean, you can truly never know what your opponent's doing, but that's a separate discussion. So anyhow, let me tell you what happened at the club. So this was a number of years ago. And of course, I'm not going to mention names or anything like that. That's not my style. So this player comes, very strong player, you know, well over 2000, I'll leave it at that, and uh, enters the tournament. And in his first game, he offers a draw in a winning position against, I think, like an 1800 player or something like that. Okay, you know, it happens. There was no time pressure situation. Maybe he got a phone call from home. Maybe something happened. Maybe he wasn't feeling well. You can't start drawing conclusions from one game. And besides, when, you know, someone rated, say, 2100 draws like an 18 or 1900 player, that's not that uncommon at the club level. That happens quite often, actually. So, you know, I was like, okay, whatever. Second game, the following week, he drew, quote unquote, drew a 1200 player with a very suspicious blunder and an unnecessary uh, threefold repetition. Kind of deliberately goes into this drawn position. For those of you who don't know, when you repeat the exact same position three times in a row, that's a draw. You claim a draw by threefold repetition for those of you new to tournaments. So anyway, at this point, my guard's up now a little bit. I'm a little suspicious. Some of the other guys at the club are now, you know, what's going on now? This is a little strange. This is two games in a row where he should have won. And, you know, he's making these ridiculous mistakes with no, you know, nothing that could have influenced it. There was no time pressure. There was no, you know, situation happening at the club or something. Okay. So, you know, two games, a little suspicious now, a little bit of a question mark. And then what really did it in the third game, the next week he lost to a 1500 player by allowing a very elementary mate in one that was easily defended. And he failed to take a piece that was hanging earlier on. So I'm now looking at the game scores for all three because some of my good friends at the club, many of whom are rated much higher than I am, they're convinced. They're like, yeah, this guy's sandbagging. There's no question. And so, you know, we're discussing it. And it's funny, we usually argue about everything in chess. In this situation, we were in complete agreement. They were like, this guy's sandbagging. There's no question. So I look at the games, I analyze it. And, you know, I double check with everybody because I'm now thinking, all right, I need to file a, an ethics complaint with the U.S. Chess Federation. So I review the games and I go over the moves. I send it, you know, to my team, so to speak. And they're still like, yes, it's definitely sandbagging because I wanted to just be very thorough. I didn't want to start going through that process unless I was absolutely sure and the evidence was clear and overwhelming, which after a lot of thought and discussion, it was. So I get my ducks in a row and then I file the ethics complaint uh, with the U.S. Chess Federation. Now, for those of you who may, may not be familiar, excuse me. It's a bit of a long and tedious process, but it's understandable considering what has to happen. From the time I filed the complaint until a decision was made, it was almost five months. So the way it works is, I'll do, I'm just going to use the word plaintiff and defendant just to make it easier, even though we're not in court. The plaintiff myself, you would file the initial complaint, you write it up. It goes to a liaison at the Federation. The committee doesn't even see anything yet. So the liaison gets my complaint gives it to the defendant who gets to write a rebuttal, which I get. Then the plaintiff gets a response to that, 
and then the defendant gets the final word. So it's basically two pieces of correspondence from each side. Each side gets two bites at the apple. Once the liaison gets all four pieces of correspondence, that goes to the committee. They review it, and then they make a decision. Now, as it turned out, they decided unanimously that my claim was correct. And they they upheld my claim. They agreed it was sandbagging, that he violated the rules. And the penalty, drumroll, was they suspended him from play for one year. All right, I hurt myself more shaving. Okay, if I'm being honest. Now, yes, I appreciate and I was glad that they ruled in my favor. But for sandbagging with clear and overwhelming evidence, that seems awfully light and not much of a deterrent. And now this is a whole nother discussion. You know, what types of punishment punishments, excuse me, should we give out for cheaters? If he had used a chess computer instead, is that worse? Should it have been a bigger punishment? You know, are there different levels? Should we ban players for life? I thought at a minimum, it should have been at least three years, maybe five. I thought a year was a little light. Just my opinion. I, that, that just doesn't seem strong enough. And players may not be deterred by that. If, if, if the only punishment for sandbagging is one year, they might be tempted to do it. But to the Federation's credit, though, they now have rating floors, which is, you know, they only allow a player to, a player's rating to drop uh, by a certain amount to avoid sandbagging. So they are taking steps toward it. Uh, it's important that I mention that. But anyway, that was the incident that uh, happened at the club. Sad to say, but, you know, we got through it. And unfortunately, these things are going to happen once in a while. As far as myself, the closest I ever came to a cheating incident was, you know, back in my early 20s, I was playing in a major event. My opponent was an eight or nine year old child. And about four or five moves into the game, he starts thumbing through his scorebook, looking at past games, which by the way, that's kind of an issue I have with these scorebooks where, you know, you, you keep score for your games, but it, because it's a book, all your past games are in there as well. It's almost like having a a reference chart like right in front of you. But anyway, he's thumbing through it, not even making an attempt to hide it. And I'm like, I just look at him and I'm like, you know, you can't do that. Like what's going on. And all of a sudden, you know, like the deer in the headlights look. And then the gentleman sitting next to me sees this and he, he jumped in even more forcefully than I did. He goes, yeah, you can't do that. Like, what are you doing? So, he was clearly flustered. So at this point, I'm like, I can do one of two things here. This can go one of two ways. I can either turn this into a thing, you know, pause the clock, get a TD, which is, you know, what I should have done. I have the benefit of experience and hindsight now. If, if there's an issue with your opponent, you're supposed to pause the clock and get a TD. But let me kind of play this out for you. I can say I can turn this into a thing. The TD is going to come over. His parents are going to come over. And I'm like, I'm going to seem like uh, I'm being, you know, a bully or something to this kid, even though I'm not, because he was wrong. Or I can just kind of let it go and just move on. And what I ended up doing was I let it go. I did just that. Because quite honestly, I just didn't want the interruption to my game. Turns out it didn't matter because he was so flustered at being caught that he ended up blundering the game away in short order. So... I mean, this was like maybe 30 minutes later, the game was done. So that's the closest I came to experiencing a cheater as a player. And unfortunately, these things happen. But I just wanted to share that with you, share some thoughts on, you know, cheating online and in clubs and and that story that happened with the sandbagger. Hopefully, you know, the rating floors that have been instituted have cracked down on it somewhat. But at any rate, As usual, I hope you win your next game, and thank you for listening. Have a great day.